Hey you guys, so I am back, you have to excuse my hair girl, I am back with a part two for The Hive. Now if y'all remember The Hive um, was about a young lady named Chrissy who was on her way to a doctor's appointment. On her way to a doctor's appointment she noticed a little girl up on the floor of this high rise um, hospital building that used to be an old psych ward. Fast forward, fast forward she ended up going up to see this young girl it turned out to be all in her head um cj who was the little girl was one of her personalities chrissy suffers from multiple personality disorder which is honestly i think is now uh classified as did disassociative identity disorder yeah so chrissy unfortunately is in a mental hospital hospital in rehab called the hive um and she awoke strapped down talking to dr gray so we're gonna go on go ahead with part two y'all i just real quick i have a cousin not to make light of this because mental health is very important okay especially right now i have a cousin who has um multiple personality disorder due to a um, extreme abuse at the hands of her father, my aunt's husband, late husband, when they were younger. And so the last time I saw my cousin, um, she kind of explained, she's very intelligent. She's actually holds a PhD. And ironically, she used to work for the government down in Houston. Makes you kind of wonder, huh? So anyway, the last time I saw my cousin was out in East Texas, Longview, Texas. She was unfortunately living in some, uh, weekly hotel, but my family would stop by and, and um, watch, you know, make sure she's okay. But I'm just going to give you an insight of what it's like to have this mental illness, unfortunately. So she said when she takes a bite to eat, envision, think of a cafeteria. When she takes a bite to eat, everybody else has a bite to eat. There's, I don't know how many. Um, uh, she almost uh, spoke to it like uh, being in a major right line. When you do a high kick, everyone else does a high kick. So that was very interesting that she explained it like that. But y'all, I started cracking up laughing because she said that one of her personalities is actually Morris Day. <laughs> Girl, I said, wait a minute, Janelle. Her name is Janelle. I said, wait a minute, Janelle. Morris Day from the time? She's like, yes, Morris Day. We even kind of look like don't we? And actually, they do. They have the similar eyes. But child, she, when she said Morris Day... I started, I, I remember singing some song with her and she started singing a song and I'm like, oh my God. So I, yeah, just, just, I just wanted to share that story real quick. Let's just jump right into the story time. So we have Chrissy, 27 years old. She awakens in a cold room. She kind of rolls over and, and her lower back is kind of hurting due to the spring mattress. Very worn spring mattress, mind you. She was kind of confused, but then she remembered she was staying at the Hive Mental and Wealth, Mental and Health Institute, now going on four weeks. She had a breakdown after the car crash that resulted in her fiance, Jeff, unfortunately passing. Now, Chrissy had had um, DID. She first had been diagnosed when she was 15, um, taking her medication. But when she met Jeff, she slowly stopped taking her pills because for the first time in a long time, she was starting to feel normal. She had happiness. So she felt like she didn't need the medicine. And so she unfortunately has been at the hive now, like I said, going on four weeks. So she wakens up, she looks around, um, and you know, they are on a schedule at this uh, mental hospital. So she knows pretty soon the lights are gonna come on and they're gonna have an hour to go into the shower area to get ready. Um, sure enough, within 15 minutes, the lights flicker on. Chrissy gets up, she grabs her flip-flops, and she heads out um, with the other women to start to shower and get ready for the day. Um, you know, the morning goes well. She has breakfast, and then she has a time to basically have like a, in a community uh, room area to where she could talk to other patients before they have group therapy later on in the evening. So she looked around. She saw the normal people. Some people looked like had already been released or possibly went home. And, you know, they had, I don't know if there's like an appeal process for a mental, for a mental institution, but I'm, I'm assuming there is. Um, 
So Chrissy knew that due to her recent outbreak, there's no way she would be released within the next week. So she looked around and she saw Miss Cora. Miss Cora was a middle-aged black woman who had been at the Hive, but she was a permanent resident. Um, Miss Cora was labeled the Manhattan Black Widow. She had supposedly poisoned her previous three husbands. Um, and she was deemed to be uh, unfit. You know, she was uh, insane, clinically, clin clinically insane. So Miss Cora waved over for Chrissy to come over to her table. Chrissy kind of hesitated, but Miss Cora was nice. Even though she was a little touch, she was a nice woman. So she sat down. And here's Chrissy. Hey, Miss Core. Uh, Miss Core is looking at her over the rims of her glasses, kind of judging her. She said, Mm-hmm. I heard what you did the other night, child. And Chrissy turned around. She said, They still haven't gotten my pills straightened out, Miss Core. I've been telling Dr. Gray that there's a certain amount of dosages that I need, and they haven't gotten it. And that's when, when Miss Core, that's when Miss Core gets her for her to be quiet. She said, Now listen here, child. I told you what you need to do. You need to keep those others at bay the best that you can. You don't want to end up like me in this raggedy, I'm going to curse y'all, but this is just how Miss Cora is, in this raggedy shithole going out for 20 years. So I told you what you need to do. Now, child, you need to listen. Chrissy kind of looked over at Miss Cora. Miss Cora, for being in the um, mental institution for 20 years, she looked re reasonably healthy, well. Her hair was always well put together. Her ha her hands and fingernails were well manicured and very clean. Uh, Chrissy wondered how long she spent in the morning getting herself together because they only had an hour, you know, to get ready. So Chrissy just, you know, remained silent and looking at her. And so that's when Miss Cora just slightly started rocking. She said, now nah, I told you, child, what you need to do. Now, are you listening to me now? And Chrissy wasn't listening. At that point, she would, you know, had started thinking about, you know, what had happened prior to the crash. Um, her and Jeff were arguing, and that's what caused the crash. Chrissy had gotten this great job um, out of the city, and Jeff wasn't ready to move. He wanted to stay, you know, in their hometown and get married and raise their children there where Cora wanted to move. I mean, sir, sorry, where Chrissy wanted to move to the city, and they were arguing about that, and that's what caused the crash, okay? Jeff veered off the road, unfortunately, and crashed the car and resulted in his untimely death. So, um, that's when Cora was like, you going down that road again, girl. I, I see what you're doing. And so Chrissy kind of snapped at it. She's like, you're right, Miss Cora. You're right. You're absolutely right. So I'm going to see if I could talk to Dr. Gray after our group session. And that's when Cora cut her off and said, now what is talking to Dr. Gray after the group sessions is going to do? What you need to do is behave. That's what they look at, darling. So you got to make sure that you don't have no more of these outbursts. Attend your group sessions. But that's it. So Chrissy looked at her and, she's, and that's when she shook her head. She said, you're right, Core. You're always right. And so that Core said, of course I'm right. I've been here for 20 years. I think I know what I'm talking about. And that's when, you know, Chrissy got up and she went towards, uh, they had like books that you could read and she went towards and was looking down at the books and that's when Sam, one of the other permanent residents came up behind her and was whispering, he said, hey, uh, Chrissy, um, you know, they told us that we can, there's a chance that we can get out. Sam had been talking about escaping the high for the past five years, child. And that's when Chrissy looked at poor Sam. She looked at him. She said, oh, yeah, Sam, you, there's a chance that we can get out. He said, yeah, there's a chance we can get out, supposedly. So are you going to, you going to join us? Are you going to join us? And so Chrissy looked down at him. Poor Sam. She thought to her. So she said, of course, Sam, I'll join you in your breakout. And so that's when Sam, you know, scooted on along. He always wore uh, pants that were a little too big for him. And for some reason, he would just, you know, hold them up by the waist instead of getting a size and getting something that was his size. Poor thing. Bless his heart. So the, days go, the um, day goes on and it's time for the group session, right? And they're sitting down. And of course, Dr. Gray is leading the group session. And of course, there were two orderlies behind her in case things get out of hand. Now, typically the um, group sessions are not violent, but they do have some people that, you know, depending on what is discussed, it can trigger one of the other patients. So, um, 
Dr. Gray starts off the uh, group therapy by asking if anyone wanted to go first, you know, experience, have they experienced anything that they want to discuss or is there anything that's been bothering them? And no one said anything. Everyone was looking. That's when Cora raised her hand and said and looked over at Creasy and said, well, it seems like some of us can't keep control of our emotions. And that's when Christy looked at her, turned around, and she sees Cora looking at her smirking. And Christy didn't say anything. And Dr. Grace said, well, that's interesting, Cora. Is there anyone in particular that you're referenced, referencing to? And that's when Cora looked at Dr. Gray and said, no, ma'am, no one in particular. Looking over at Christy, and Christy's like, what the hell? I thought that Cora was my friend. We've been in here together for, you know, for four, going on four weeks. And why is she calling her out like this? So everyone takes their time, you know, their turn talking about what's been going on and, you know, any changes or any improvements that they have had um, for the course of the week. Most, most of them haven't, just to be honest. Most of them haven't. And so Chrissy thought about it and Dr. Gray looked at her. She said, Chrissy, I noticed you've been really quiet. Is there anything that you want to add to the conversation? Chrissy kind of looked down at her shoes and she thought about it. And so she thought about what Cora said also about do whatever you can, just be on your best behavior. And so that's when Chrissy spoke and said, um, Dr. Gray, I understand that my outburst last week was unacceptable. I fully acknowledge that. Um, I'm a, I, I, I apologize. And I do feel like these group sessions have been helping me. So another 10 minutes wrap up and that's the end of the uh, group therapy session. And as they're getting up, Chrissy goes over to Cora going in and she's like, Miss Cora. And Cora looked up at her. Miss Cora was only four foot and 11, y'all. She was a short woman. Miss Cora looked up at her. She said, yes. She said, well, what was that about? Why did you call me out like that? She said, well, you ended up speaking, didn't you? And Chrissy looked down at her. She Now she figured out why Miss Cora had done that. It basically forced her to, you know, speak in the group session. So Chrissy was like, okay. And she smiled at her. Miss Cora kind of smiled at her back. And so they go on in, y'all. And um, I'm looking at my neighbors, sorry, y'all. They go on in and um, they have another recreational time. Either they can go outside or stay in the community area before it's time to go to bed, right? So I said, going to bed. Um, you know, Chrissy's getting ready to um, get down for bed. And all of a sudden, she hears some soft scratching. She's looking around. She's like, what's that noise? And she gets up and she looks down because their doors are locked, baby. They go into a room and they lock their doors. So she looks down and she sees footsteps in front of her. She's like, what's going on? And all of a sudden she sees a piece of note go under her door. She gets up out of bed. And she gets down, she leans down, she picks up the sheet of paper, she unfolds it, and it reads, it's almost time, S. She's like, it's almost time, S. She's like, what does that mean? It's almost time, S. All of a sudden, the fire alarm goes out, goes on. It's when the fire alarm goes off, the doors automatically, automatically release, and everyone's supposed to line up and head outside. So, she's um, lining up, she's following protocol. She takes the note and she stuffs it down in her bra real quick. So she's following protocol going through, you know, there's about, hmm, I guess about five women in front of her, right? She's following protocol. All of a sudden she's, you know, they're going down the hallway. There's a guard in front of them. There's no one behind them though. And the guard is on, on her, um, what do you call it y'all? Her walkie talkie. And she's like, where is Latrell? Latrell was supposed to be behind him. And that's when she got a call. Um, another person on the end said, we can't find her. So just go ahead. And so the guard turned around. She's like, all right, y'all, it's just me. I need for y'all to follow exactly what I say. So Chris is just following the four people in front of her. All of a sudden, she hears whisperings. Someone's calling her name for the hallway to her right. Chrissy, Chrissy. She turns around and it's Sam. Sam beckoning her to follow him. All right, y'all. That's part two of the hive.